to us there and, and thanks everyone who's organizing it. It's such a pleasure to be at the at the real meeting again and talk with real people who have feet and such. It's fun. Um, so I'll talk about I was a bit debating what to talk about. I'll talk about cloud parentizations. Um, I wanted to talk generally about how to calibrate climate models, parts of them and the whole model with data, but I'll talk about cloud parentizations specifically. And I'll show some work that the basics of it goes back to things that Andrew Stewart and I started doing a number of years ago, and by now there's a large team of people working with us. And I'll show some results from well, people I introduce as we go along that are named right here. So, if you, climate predictions are uncertain, we've seen that. And if you want to find one primary reason why they're uncertain, it's this, low clouds. Low clouds off the coast of California, we're somewhere just up here. We have seen it this morning, stratocumulus clouds coming over the, over the uh, coast here. They're basically out there with the ocean year round, covering about 20% of tropical oceans, white blanket over the ocean, reflecting sunlight, cooling the earth underneath. If you fly to, to the Hawaiian Islands, um, you see a scene that looks like that. You have scattered cumulus clouds and dark ocean exposed underneath, and the area is warmer in part because there are fewer clouds covering the ocean. And these clouds are a problem for climate models. Climate models produce vastly different responses of these clouds to global warming. Some produce more clouds, some produce fewer clouds. And that is the primary, but not only source of uncertainty in climate predictions. So if you get more of these stratocumulus clouds, for example, as the climate warms, you get less warming because more sunlight is reflected. If you get fewer clouds, most, more sunlight is absorbed and you get more warming. And there is an emerging consensus that this feedback is amplifying, meaning that probably you'll get fewer clouds as the climate warms, but the magnitude varies widely across models and even the sign still varies across models. It is the primary source of uncertainty. If you would, put, would, put, would want to put a number on it in terms of dollars, you know, the socioeconomic value of climate predictions, of better climate predictions, has been estimated to lie in the trillions of dollars. This is the primary reason that they are uncertain. So this is literally the billion to trillion dollar question what these clouds do. And you know, the climate scientists here know it, but let me just say why the clouds are difficult. I mean, if you fly over the ocean, you look down, at least that was my, my reaction a decade ago, you see a white blanket under, underneath you and you can ask why is a white blanket difficult to simulate? It's very large scale, it's, it, for stratocumulus at least. But it's difficult to simulate for a number of reasons and one, one intuitive way to think about it is this. If you take all water in the atmosphere and put it as a liquid layer to the surface, you get a liquid layer that's about an inch thick, 25 millimeters. So water itself is a trace constituent in the atmosphere. Almost all water in the atmosphere is in the form of vapor. If you take all condensed water in the atmosphere, meaning the clouds you see, droplets, ice crystals, bring that to the surface as a liquid layer, you get a layer 100 microns thick. So it's about the thickness of a human hair or a coat of paint on the wall here or something. So now you have a climate model. You try to predict the tiny residual of water that condenses in updrafts in clouds. And without knowing anything more about the physics of this, you can imagine this is really hard to do. If you have a trace constituent of the atmosphere, water vapor, a tiny residual of that condenses as air rises and cools and updrafts to form clouds. And we don't do well predicting that, or we don't do well even simulating that in the present climate and climate models. Um, another more common way of looking at it is that the dynamical scales that are relevant for clouds are all small. So clouds are maintained by turbulence, convection, updrafts in, 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 in the turbulent flow. And the scales of these updrafts for the low clouds, especially the low clouds over the oceans here, of order of meters to tens of meters. Um, a climate model has a resolution of typically 100 kilometers going towards 50. And some models have been run at kilometer scale resolution for short times. Uh, but that's still a far cry from what you need to resolve these clouds. So even if you could do kilometer scale resolution, you're still a factor 100 or so away in resolution of what you need to resolve the clouds. And because the computational effort is for isotropic changes um, in resolution is, is to the fourth power of the resolution change. So it's a 10 to the eight factor and flops that would be missing if it's isotropic. And you can argue if it's a million or 10 to the eight that's missing depending what, what you assume for the vertical, but it's, it is far, far, for us to be able to resolve these clouds by brute force computing. It's not going to happen anytime soon. 
So the way clouds are represented is, is fairly ad hoc in models. Somewhat empirical, but often not even all that empirical. I mean, the, the principal ways clouds are being represented go back to good ideas in the 1970s that were adequate for the data and the computational resources at the time. And you can question whether these ideas are still the ideas we should be pursuing given the data we have now and the computational resources we have now. So we want to improve climate predictions. At least that's what gets me out of bed in the morning. And obviously, this is a machine learning conference. You, you wonder how can we use data to improve the state of the art here. And I want to talk about how you can use data. But before we jump into what we actually do, I think it's important to be clear about special requirements for climate predictions. Um, we have a lot of data about the Earth system. It's, a, it's a, about a terabyte per day that we acquire. But if you count degrees of freedom in data against degrees of freedom in turbulent flow, it's not nearly enough to blindly learn, say, the climate system from data. It just can't be done. Now, moreover, what we want to predict is something that's not even in the data. We have no observed analog for climate change. So we need generalizability out of sample. And it's, it's imperative for climate because that, that's the name of the game. Um, you want climate models to be used. I want them to be used. We have to adapt to climate change. You have to build infrastructure that's ad adapted to what is to come, the new normal, stronger rainfall and the like. And for people to use climate predictions, they need to trust them in some fashion. And I think for trust, it's essential that you can understand what is going on in the model, going from data to output, that this is as transparent as possible. And again, for planning, you need, you need not just point estimates of what climate change you'll get, but you need uncertainty quantification. You need to attach probabilities to extreme events, not just say it could happen, but say something about the probability of you know, a certain amount of rainfall happening, because you need to build stormwater management infrastructure that's adapted for that. So these are three requirements that I think are essential in climate and more important than in other applications of machine learning. Um, talk a bit more about it. There's a Physics Today article that uh, Rob Sokolo, Nadir Jivanji at Princeton and I wrote a few months ago. You can read a bit more about, it's a, meant to be a popular article about the general ideas here. So deep learning, I, I saw Steve Brunton's talk on, on Monday. He, I think, made some similar points and it's maybe worth re-emphasizing them again. Deep learning success rests on, if you want to put it in one word, over parentization. It gives very expressive models that become very good function approximators, but it results in very data hungry methods because you end up having to learn a lot of parameters. Um, and that has been tremendously successful in many areas, but it makes generalizability, interpretability, and uncertainty quantification challenging. Traditional science, since Bacon, it's called reductionist science, it rests on a principle that you might call parametric sparsity. It focuses on models that have as few parameters as possible. So Steve made the same point that I've made in talks a number of times. Newton's law of universal gravitation is one great example. It's a one parameter model. It gives you planetary motions. It gives you apples falling, falling from trees, all in one parameter model. And it replaced the deep learning approach of its time, Ptolemy's epicycles, which tried to approximate planetary motion by overlaid circular motions in a way it used circles as a primitive functions for approximation. You can approximate anything to arbitrary accuracy that way, but you need a lot of parameters. Kepler came around and said ellipses are better fits. You have a sparser representation and Newton condensed it all to a simple model. This has been tremendously successful for 400 years, this approach in science. And you know, a lot of us have tried to use reduction of science alone to come up with a coarse gain description, say, of clouds. And we have learned a few things, but you know, it hasn't been successful to the degree that you want it to be successful, that you can use it for predictions. So reductionist science reaches its limits in complex systems where in the end there are emergent phenomena that are not easily derivable consequences of the equations of motion. And I think we have seen it reaching its limits in climate modeling. But both data science approaches have the value, reduction of science has its value, and, and our approach is to take the best of both worlds, um, use 
reductionist science as far as you can go, you will reach a limit. And at the point at which you reach the limit, you can use ideas from, from the data sciences to go further. But I think it's important to go to the limit of reductionist science, not try to take a shortcut the taxi to the finish line. Um, what this means somewhat more concretely, and then I'll get very concrete. Um, reductionist science means you need to advance theory. And I'll show you some examples where we have been very successful with it in, in the cloud realm. I won't show you examples where we have worked on land modeling, for example, and biophysics modeling. We know more about the physics of plants than I knew two years ago. And, and even, even if you model the, the biosphere, you can be quite successful in going further with theory than people have done before. So we know, use equations of motion where you have them, systematically coarse grain them, and what you get from it is you promote parametric sparsity and you remove the burden on the data to learn things that you can get from the equations of motion. And I'll show you how it works for clouds. And as I said, I mean, it even works for plants. We know something about your hydraulics, how water moves in plants. You can use that in plant modeling quite explicitly. Computing power has increased enormously, exponentially, um, since the early days of climate modeling. It's about a factor 10 to the nine increase in uh, computer performance. There is a bit of a lament in a climate modeling community about the transition that's underway in, in hardware architectures. You all have to learn to use GPUs and what other, whatever other accelerator architectures come around, TPUs and the like. It's a bit of a lament because it requires recoding climate models. It's hard, um, but it's an opportunity. We have to recode a lot of climate models anyway, so we can rethink about how we want to use the computing architectures that are there. And we can rethink models too. And we do want to harness data. We have a lot of data about the Earth system. As I said, it's, it's about a terabyte per day or so that we are acquiring. For the last few decades, we have great observations of the Earth atmosphere, the upper ocean at least. The ocean is becoming ever more data rich with floats and the like. We want to use these data. They are not used in climate modeling to the extent that you think they might they should be used. I mean, they're used for model evaluation, but they're rarely used directly to inform a model in a development process. And I think you need to take all three points seriously to make progress. And I think just betting on any one of them alone, I think will not succeed. Just computing more and having a high resolution model, it will not get you to resolve low clouds. There's no way. Um, just theory alone, well, we tried. It probably doesn't get you there either. And entirely data-driven approaches probably will not succeed either because you end up with a too heavily or franchise model. But if you combine all three, I think you can succeed. So what, what we are doing, we as in this Klima project, the Climate Modeling Alliance, with people at JPL, MIT, Caltech, it's about 70 of us by now. We are doing all three, advanced theory, exploit data, and exploit computing resources. And what it might mean in a cartoon, say, we have data from space, from the ground, observational data that you ultimately want to use. That's really the ground truth. You can generate data computationally. We cannot simulate clouds globally, no way. But you can simulate them in limited domains, the size of, say, 10 kilometers on the site or so. You can do high resolution simulations of clouds that are very good. Um, you still need to parameterize microphysics, droplet formation, and the like. But the dynamics you can resolve. Newton's laws governing the clouds, we know those. So you can embed these simulations, say, in one column of a climate model, or perhaps in hundreds of thousands of them. They provide data from which you can learn how to coarse grain the motions underlying clouds. I'm just trying to sketch this schematically here. Now we have Stokes equation, say there's some stress term, and that stress term ultimately, you probably can make some progress in theory what it should look like, but ultimately there our parameters, parametric functions, non-parametric functions appearing, just indicated by this alpha, beta, gamma, that you can learn from data. And data here can be high resolution simulations or observations. So let me just show you a concrete example from modeling clouds. And I, um, I use modeling clouds here as a shorthand for saying more modeling turbulence convection on clouds altogether, um, all the motions that make up clouds. So I'll show some work from, uh, a number of people, Yayo Cohen has been working on this for a number of years. Uh, Ignacio Lopez Gomez is a grad student, has been working on it for a few years. Jahe um, joined us also a few years ago. 
Anna Yaruga is working on microphysics of clouds, and Jawi has been doing large eddy simulations that I show some of. And uh, Charlie Kaczynski is a software engineer working with this group. And there's maybe one other lesson to be learned about the value of software engineers and scientists working closely together. This is, I think, a great example of here of how this group has made tremendous progress by software engineers working literally next to scientists. So on the theory side, what we do is you take the equations of motion, which we know, laws of thermodynamics, Newton's laws, and you coarse grain them. And of course, we coarse grain them in a specific way that is well adapted to the turbulent flows we're interested in. We do what's called good conditional averaging, where you separate the flow domain into coherent structures, say some updraft here, and the more isotropic turbulent environment, where you just have isotropic mixing, or relatively isotropic mixing. And you conditionally average the equations of motion over these different parts of the flow domain, which are themselves flow dependent. It's conditionally averaging because the averaging becomes flow dependent. And in the end, there are certain exchange terms appearing, for example, entrainment, detrainment refers to the mass exchange between coherent structures and the isotropic environment that in the end you need to represent by parentalizations. In terms of equations, this is actually what it looks like. And uh, I was just at, at lunch telling me Andrew, Andrew Stewart asked me the, the other day to actually write down all the equations. It, it takes several slides. This is just a sketch. And it, it's a relatively complicated set of PDEs that, that results. But the structure of them, I hope, looks familiar. And you don't need to go through all details. I want to point out a few crucial points. For example, you end up with a continuity equation that becomes an equation for the area of fraction A occupied either by this turbulent environment, index zero, or coherent plumes, indices one to n, there can be n of them. And otherwise, you know, the left-hand side is a pretty standard conservation law. It's a continuity equation like you would be familiar with. And on the right-hand side, there are these exchange terms appearing, representing entrainment, detrainment of mass between plumes and the environment. Otherwise, it's pretty standard. For, for the climate folks among you, an interesting thing is happening here. We wrote the equation consciously in this way. So on the left-hand side are all the terms that end up being terms you saw from the fluid dynamical core of the model. So it's a full prognostic equation for this area fraction. So what you mean by a prioritization becomes quite different from what's traditional in that, for example, here is the upward mass flux in these updrafts. It just becomes part of what the dynamical core solves for rather than part of a prioritization. You have time dependent terms that are explicit. They turn out to be important at high resolutions for things like a journal cycle of convection. You can do the same thing for any scalar variable. The scalar could be a vertical velocity, it could be thermodynamic variable. You can do the same thing for higher order statistics. We go to second order. Um, you end up in our case, I think with eight such PDEs for various moments. The crucial thing for us here is that on the right-hand side, there are terms appearing that are not closed. So there's this entrainment detrainment that appears in the scalar equation as well. It's the same epsilon and delta. The turbulent transport terms, which we close diffusively with a diffusivity that in turn depends on the turbulent kinetic energy, which is solved explicitly by some such equation, second moment equation. Then you need a closure for the mixing length that appears and the like. And we don't need to get into the details here. The central point is you end up with closure functions on the right-hand side. This is the stuff now where theory really can't go all that much further. We maybe know some limits of what they look like, but we don't know precisely what these functions are. And this is, these are good targets for learning from data in various ways. So I'll show you some results where we're doing is come up with relatively simple forms for these functions. So we do what fluid dynamicists since Prantl have been doing for the last hundred years. You just identify the non-dimensional groups in the problem. Then you say, well, epsilon delta, they happen, they happen to have a dimension of one over length. There's a natural length scale in the problem, inverse length scale, the buoyancy divided by vertical velocity squared. And then these, these functions are only determined up to some unknown function of all the other non-dimensional parameters. And this unknown function well, in what, what I'm going to show you, we just guessed the function that was reasonable. Um, but this function you can learn from data. And similar story for pressure gradients appearing. Don't need to go into the details here. One success story, I think, was the eddy diffusion. So it depends on the turbulent kinetic energy and the mixing length. The mixing length, it's something that Ignacio Lopez Gomez worked on. He has a very nice sort of first principle theory 
for ultimately what the right mix mixing length is. It turns out there are many possible length scales and there's an optimal way of combining them based on minimum dissipation arguments that was extremely successful. So I just want to show you some results. And these results are with arduous guessing of functions so that what we ended up with was nine numbers for everything here that remained open, nine parameters. And in some ways it was a bit of a frustrating process, but it was a successful process. So on the, on the left is a, a figure from, um, it shows the cloud bias in the typical climate simulation from the French model in this case, but it looks similar in just about all climate models. So red just means there are too few clouds in the stratocumulus regions, blue too many clouds. And this map is only here to orient you, you where we are. So in the upper right, you're looking at a polar boundary layer in Greenland. Lower right, you're looking at a stratocumulus top boundary layer off, off the coast of uh, Baja California, California. So these panels show in solid large eddy simulations, so high resolution simulations of a field campaign, Gables field campaign in the top panel. So these are simulations with 2 million degrees of freedom, computationally expensive and the rest. And then various dashed dotted lines show our one dimensional model. So it's a 1D model, in this case at different vertical resolutions. And the shading shows other large eddy simulations done by other groups. And you see the shading already shows quite a range of answers from even high resolution simulations for this is the velocity in, the, in a very shallow stable boundary layer. The nice thing is that our 1D model basically captures the LES results exactly if you go to high enough resolution and even at coarse resolution it does pretty well. And this has just a few dozen degrees of freedom in terms of resolution rather than 2 million. And better yet, so the bottom is the stratocumulus top boundary layer. Climate models all have trouble simulating stratocumulus. Black is our own large eddy simulation, which is, I think, quite good. And the dots are some observations. This is liquid water in the cloud. Shading is, again, the range of large eddy simulations, just to show that even large eddy simulations have a hard time reproducing this. And then the blue is just the, is the single column model that captures these stratocumulus clouds extremely well. We can go through other examples, it's a Caribbean cumulus cloud. This is a standard field campaign from 1969 that everyone who works in this area tries to reproduce BOMEX. It's not considered a terribly hard case. We can do this too, but others can too. Gets a bit more interesting, convection over the Amazon. This is vertical velocity here in large, in large eddy simulation. The interesting part is there's a distinct diurnal cycle to convection. So it just sits on right here, vertical velocity picks up. And our 1D model gets this onset of deep convection, pretty much the timing exactly right and the rest. So this is one model with nine parameters capturing all these different regimes. And that's uh, satisfying and I think at first in, 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 in parentization development. And the only calibration that has happened was just tweaking these nine parameters somewhat by hand. Um, with a few large eddy simulations we had at the time we published this, it was five or six. So since then, Jawi has been doing a lot of large eddy simulations. What she did is drive large eddy simulation with output from a climate model, and that allows you to generate many different case studies. So we have, I think, about 400 now and going towards 1,000. So for example, here's a transect through the Pacific, going from strata cumulus to more cumulus situation over here. And Jawi has done a lot more of these simulations. So now we're using these simulations. Well, the first thing I thought would happen is we have these simulations and our parentization will be terrible because this is out of sample and it will not work. And the really great part was it worked. Not always great, but it worked. So we can we can simulate the strata cumulus in these LES cases. We can capture them with a single column model. And now we're using these large eddy simulations to calibrate the parentization. So right now, this is just learning nine parameters and nine numbers. It's not, not, uh, not machine learning in that sense. There are loss functions you need to choose. So there are vertical profiles of everything that matters here, velocity, liquid water, total water, fluxes, kinetic energy, and the like. And here's just an example from, from Ignacio Lopez Gomez's work. He's just finishing this up. So here's just one example. The orange is what the model did with our hand calibrated values before. And after a calibration round, we can reproduce the vertical fluxes, in this case of liquid water potential temperature quite well. The liquid water in the stratocumulus cloud that already was quite good before gets a little bit better before and the like. 
So this is just you know the simplest case, learning some scalar parameters and functions we have guessed. The somewhat frustrating aspect of this work was that we had to guess functions and they're complicated and you know we don't know if they're right. I mean, there's no hard physics that guides you there. It's just some intuition. What we're doing right now is just a sampling of some ongoing work. Um, as one student, Hawk and Ervik, is making these functions stochastic because it makes sense for there to be noise. There's no scale separation. They should be stochastic, and we're experimenting with various ways of doing it. We're trying to get away from this business of guessing the functions. We have enough data point now that we can learn the functions. And we're trying various approaches, random feature models um, as, as one approach. We're just about to start working with Anima and Ankuma and some of her students on learning operators, could be neural operators, perhaps. perhaps. There are mappings between function spaces so that you learn from the say entrainment rate as a function of temperature in the vertical and what the output would be entrainment rate as a function of the vertical as well so you lose discretization dependence and the like we have worked a fair bit on models for structural error and how to include them happy to talk with people about it how to do this um, that comes with a few special requirements but they can basically be included wherever you make the error so the cleanup project as a whole, we are trying to pursue the same approach for eventually all components of a climate model or system model. The MIT group has an ocean model. Caltech, we're working on the atmosphere, working on land together with JPL people. And then biosphere, we have a pretty good model. ICE, we have nothing yet. Um, these are just pretty standard process-informed models. And wrapped around it is a layer of data simulation machine learning tools to inform them in the end jointly with data. So I only showed you calibration with simulated data and only for one component. The idea is to do it for all components jointly and with, um, with observational data as well. That's ultimately what, what matters. So just a quick rundown how you do this for model components broadly. And this is now a work with Andrew and a bunch of students, postdocs we have together, Oli Dumber, Mike Howland is an assistant professor at MIT now. Daniel Jin Long, still working with us, and Alfredo is a, an assistant professor in Mexico now. The, the key to doing this for a climate model, I think, is the following. What matters in climate is you want to predict statistics, mean values, extremes, and the like. This, this is what counts. This is where the money is in climate predictions. And so from the outset, we wanted to calibrate a model by learning from statistics. You have a few advantages doing that. A, you focus on what matters. B, you get smoother objective functions because averaging is a smoothing operation. So you don't have as rough a problem as you have in weather forecasting, say, where you learn from trajectories and their chaotic dependence on initial condition. If no dependence on initial conditions, aside from ocean initial condition, ice perhaps, that, that is crucial. You can include things that you really care about, precipitation extremes and the loss function. The downside is if you do this, evaluating the loss function becomes extremely expensive because you need to do seasonal simulations and longer for every loss function evaluation. And that quickly becomes enormous. So the setting for solving this problem, Alistair is telling me I need to speak faster. <laughs> the, setting for, the setting for solving this problem is that um, you have a mapping G that maps some parameters to some data Y and the data are statistics of the climate system accumulated in time. The mapping is a noisy mapping because of finite time averaging. You can assume there's a central limit theorem holding and the, the noise is plausibly Gaussian. There's a few special features to it. The, the parameters can include parameters in structural model errors. They can include parameters in, in neural networks if you have them in there. It can be understood quite generally. We generally do not have derivative information about the model or do not want to have it perhaps if it's complicated to get. And we want both to calibrate the parameters and quantify uncertainties. And the data, Y, only provide indirect information about the processes in which these parameters appear. So that makes it a bit challenging in some ways. And the way we have come up with to solve this problem in a way that's doable for climate model is the following. It's an algorithm we call calibrate emulate sample. It's combining ideas from weather forecasting, data assimilation with ideas from machine learning, process emulation, in, into an algorithm for very fast and very scalable Bayesian learning. In the calibration step, what we do is use common in, inversion, common sampling, variance thereof, to generate pairs of parameters and maps from parameters to output 
G. And we do it in, in such a way, what common inversion does is it, it's a very good optimizer of the parameters. So it gets you near the maximum posterior in a, in a Bayesian setting. And it does so in a very scalable way, even high dimensional parameter spaces. And weather forecasting, you do the 10 to the nine dimensional parameter spaces. So we know this algorithm scales. What you get out of it are pairs of simulated data Y and parameters. And on these pairs, you can train an emulator. So typically you have perhaps five iterations of a common inversion algorithm with an ensemble of size 100, you have 500 pairs. And on these pairs, you can train an emulator. And this emulator can be any number of things. I'll show you an example with the Gaussian process there. Um, it could be neural network, random feature model, it can be any number of things. The key is the emulator is cheap to evaluate and you can do Markov chain Monte Carlo on that in the end with a million iterations if you want. It costs next to nothing relative to the first calibration step. The upshot of that is you get about a factor thousand speed up or thousand speed up over traditional Bayesian learning simply because you only need some few hundred iterations here or loss function evaluations in the first step. And that's the expensive step. Everything else is cheap in comparison. It builds some proven algorithms that scale, that scale to high dimensions. And so the whole pipeline becomes something very efficient to use in a climate model. And um, in the remaining one minute that Alistair is giving me, I'm not going to show you all of it. Common inversion converges. Um, Let me maybe say this. So I, I was I was going to show you an example, and I'm only sketching it here. Here is just the example was an idealized climate model. There's two parameters and a simple convection scheme, um, a loss function that ex includes some measure of intense precipitation, mean precipitation, relative humidity, and here you have this, these are the terms in the loss function: relative humidity as a function of latitude, blue from a climate model, the um, whiskers giving you a 95% confidence in from climate model and the orange shading is a Gaussian process emulator. So just to say this emulator captures both the mean and the variability well. What the common inversion and variance thereof do well is smoothing the objective function that you don't get stuck in local minima. They do well in focusing the learning on the on the region of parameter space that matters near the maximum of posteriori and what you get is an efficient emulator. You can sample the emulator and outcome um, posterior densities and blue shading here in this two-dimensional parameter space. The key point here is here is an ensemble that has collapsed as is well known in common inversion, the ensemble collapses. It's not a good measure of uncertainty. The posterior density we're getting here is a good measure of uncertainty. This problem is simple enough that we can brute force compute posterior densities and no, this is actually a, uh, a good Bayesian posterior computed at yeah, roughly a thousandth of the cost of standard methods. You can draw from the posterior, make climate predictions with it, and you get climate predictions with quantified uncertainties. This is a prediction of extreme precipitation, won't go through it. And let me just um, maybe just, just summarize some key points here. So I think. You know, scientists, I want to understand the climate system, but climate science as a field, I think what we are measured by is how good the predictions are that we deliver. And my my goal, at least, is try to make them better. And I think it's possible to reduce uncertainties and quantify uncertainties in climate models. It's possible and within reach. And I think it's essential to combine process-informed models, physics-driven where it's physics, or biology-driven where it's biology and the like, this data-driven approaches that exploit climate statistics. I think it's really crucial. It makes it different from weather prediction. Um, it's a way of taming the chaos is averaging. We have been quite successful with these physics based subquid scale models and can capture turbulence cloud regimes that have vexed climate models for decades. And they can in principle learn both from observations. We haven't done that yet is to come. And from high resolution simulations, that is what we have done and are currently doing. This Calibrate Emulate sample algorithm is scalable, generalizable, works with any computationally expensive model like a climate model. And it's essentially a, a way of doing Bayesian learning that is something like a thousand times faster than standard methods. Lots of work is to be done. Ours is a very much an open project. Uh, if people want to join, please join. 
word of thanks to our funders, Eric and Wendy Schmidt primarily, and the National Science Foundation, I think Simons Foundation, and uh, Charlie Trimble and a few others got us started early on. So I stop right there and happy to answer questions. Yeah. I, I really didn't want to rush you, but- um, You did, but- Okay, anyway. so we'll have some questions. Um, if we could get a question from some early career scientists, that'd be wonderful first, please. Anyone? Not meaning to put you on the spot, but this is your opportunity. Early career scientists, ECRs, we refer to them. Anyone? And even I'm early career, by the way, just because I'm gray, I'm not. So. Yeah. All right, Law, you're up. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, hopefully it's on now. Yeah. yeah, perfect. Yeah, so two questions. So related to learning the functions, right? So so at the end of the day, you, you're still stuck with learning a parameterization. And so, as you said, theory gets you so far because we need to come up with some relationship between, you know, the resolved variables and their effect on the large scale flow. So, you know, you mentioned neural operators, of course, we've done some interpretability work by by using kind of you know sparse regression and, and learning functions. So, so what do you see the best approach? I mean, with neural you know with neural operator, which is like groundbreaking, you can do that for the atmosphere. For example, for the ocean, we can't do much because you're in spectral space for the most part. So yeah, I mean, kind of I mean, the short answer is all of the above, that. right? We don't know. I mean, it's, I think it's it's nice to be able to experiment, and we are experimenting. I'm glad that people are experimenting. But I think maybe one thing is crucial. It's really, I think the learning has to be confined to these places where you can't go further, like entrainment rates, right? Um, as a result of which, you do not have direct information about these processes in any kind of data, not even simulations. It's very hard to impossible to diagnose even in a simulation. So the learning is still from indirect data that limits perhaps some approaches, but it also means you, once you have a pipeline set up, and you have that now that kind of automates it, you can plug in and, and try out. You can do dictionary learning of terms. You can do your favorite approach, neural networks, Gaussian processes, or, or simply, you know, Fourier series and <laughs> parametric functions, right? And we're trying all of them. Uh, can we have Anish next? Thanks. A yeah, great talk, very thought provoking talk here. Um, so I was wondering, you mentioned about using the MCMC to overcome the Gaussianity, um, potential Gaussianity limitation for Kalman inversion. I was wondering of specific examples where you have derived like higher moments of parameters or like you know, fatter tails or um, parameters that the Kalman inversion got like a Gaussian distribution of it, but when you do an MCMC, you get like a non-Gaussian distribution in your test cases. So you have to be careful about one thing here. So common inversion gives you exact solutions for Gaussian systems, right? right. And gives you exact so posteriors. Right. Right. And it doesn't anywhere else. But it doesn't mean that what comes out is, is yeah. Gaussian, right? So you still get these pairs of parameters and yeah. G of thetas. And on those, you can train an emulator. And it can be anything. I mean, we have plenty of examples where it has, that has bizarre shapes, ridges, multi-valued situations, and the like. I mean, it doesn't need to be Gaussian is, is the short answer. And it doesn't, it, it typically isn't. I mean, you, we, we do what everyone would do. You transform the parameters to a space where they are unbounded and it can plausibly be Gaussian, right? So yeah. the parameters that have, be, be, have to be between zero and one, you transform them so that they live on a real axis and you can plausibly get the close to Gaussian distribution, but then the end result doesn't have to be Gaussian at all. And it, it isn't. Okay. Okay, thanks. Yeah, back to the, uh, the parameterization problem. So when you have a target function in, in the subgrid scale, and then you have, um, do you exactly know what the inputs are, and you just want to learn the functional form? Or is it that you are a little bit uncertain of which of the inputs are directly relevant and which are maybe only indirectly relevant? Yeah, I mean, we, we do know, again, you form non-dimensional groups, you know how many there are. You don't a priori know which of those matter and which one don't. That becomes a question of experimenting. Yeah. Um, it can be very helpful to use L1 regularization to 
again, yeah. promote sparsity and kick out parameters and dependencies that don't matter. We have done that. Um, but yeah, you know, you know, to the extent that you can assume these functions to be local, you know what they can depend on. Okay. You can question whether they should be local, right? That becomes a causality question yeah. and, and over which time scales you're looking at things. But to the extent that they are local, you know what they can possibly depend on. And then some of these parameters they not, may not depend on in the end. Yeah, a follow up. Is your target function is always the next time step and the inputs are from the previous time step. It's never that they are from two steps before, like from a, because uh, the closures, so, are they always still preserving that dependency or is it that they, they are more, you need delayed more? Um, yeah. So a few crucial things, the, I mean, I just, the learning is all from statistics. There's no time steps, right? It's all average on time. The closure functions in principle could um, themselves depend on auxiliary equations. I, I wouldn't want to, we are trying not to think in time steps, you try to think about continuous equations. So it's conceivable that there's a helper function that in itself is time dependent, it could be a stochastic differential equation that determines parameters or structures of the closure function. Say for the, for the closure for the mixing, th that depends on the turbulent kinetic energy and the turbulent kinetic energy has its own PDE, right? So there is a time dependence built in and the history dependence built in and the like through the PDE dependence. But wherever there is this non-locality in space or time, we try to model it through differential equations. So I have two questions about the Elias library. One is, I guess it's related to that optimal targeting. So do you have some metrics that guide where you uh, choose the regions for the high resolution simulations uh, or it's mostly physic, uh, physical understanding and intuition? The second question is, are the Elias always uh, driven by the GCM outputs from the current climate simulations or you also have future simulations in there? Yeah, so the first question, so Oli has worked on algorithms for optimal targeting of LES. Um, will be in a journal near you sometime soon. Um, so it, you can ask in, within the context of the CES algorithm, you can ask optimality questions. So what, what is the maximum information gain in space and time and target it that way? We haven't actually done that for what I showed you here. The, these LES were done at a collection of um, sites called CF sites from cloud model into comparison projects where climate models provide the high resolution output that you need. And now few climate models actually provide all the output you need. So we have done it with a number of CMIP5, CMIP, there's only one CMIP6 model that provides the output needed so far, but the few CMIP5 models and we have done it for present climate and we have done it for warmer climates. So yeah. Any other questions? Yeah, so in terms of optimizing <laughs> parameters versus in, uh, like doing data simulation for initialized weather prediction, like how do you view like state dependent parameters? Do we need to continuously optimize our parameters for the climate problem? Or you think once we optimize parameters based on previous data, then those parameters are fixed and and also related to that, the climate data assimilation problem. Do we need deep ocean data assimilation in this framework to do the climate problem? Yeah, so, I mean, the parameters here can be, they can be parametric functions, non-parametric functions of whatever is going on around them. I think I want to take causality seriously, so near them in space and time meaning they can be implicitly climate state dependent through say temperature dependence in their environment, right? But if if your parameter would become explicitly climate state dependent, that's a bit like saying, you know, the gravitational constant is different from Mars and Earth and you have somehow done something wrong in the basic model, that, that shouldn't be the case. I mean, if it's the case, it's an indication, if you find that to be the case, it's an indication that the physical model isn't correct, right? And should go back and try to correct it. And the deep ocean, I mean, if, you know, if in the end you want to use the system for climate prediction on decadal timescales, then you would want to have deep ocean data assimilation to get the initial condition right, okay. right? Um, for say learning from observational data over the last 40 years, you can do this in this AMIP type setting where you prescribe sea surface temperatures if you want to learn about the atmosphere at least, and don't need to worry about the deep ocean. If you want to do this for the ocean, 
Uh, you can focus on shorter time scales as well, say seasonal cycle of mixed layer depths in a southern ocean and the like. It's probably not strongly dependent on what's going on in the deep ocean. Thanks. Okay, so um, we have one more. Um, Robert, would you like just come, Robert? Would you like to come and get your slides ready? We'll um, switch you over. And um, if I'm going to switch you over, so that, yeah, here we can buy him up. And use this microphone to answer the question. Go ahead. Sure. Yeah, I just wanted to give you a moment to uh, comment on the software innovations you're most excited about. I'm specifically wondering if uh, once you have the operational model, you'll have a differentiable one where you can couple the calibration. Is that part of the plan? And and I had a, another question about the. Well, I leave it there and talk offline. But yeah, just what what are you most excited about about Quima's innovation in the software and HPC realms? And what's your thoughts on differentiability? Maybe let me start with differentiability. It's a bit easier. Uh, we are not worrying about it. Is a short answer. I mean, it, it, I think there will probably be parts of the model that will not be differentiable and. We have experimented with automatic differentiation and for a few specific, in a few specific contexts, say for implicit solvers to compute Jacobians. It ended up not being, well, it ended up being slow, let's say, for answer about such other approaches. So it's not something I consider terribly important, although if we can make it work in the end, great. Software innovation, um, maybe the most, the nicest part is that you get clean, very usable software that I hope will be nice for research for students to use and the like that where you can you have one environment for running a model for post processing data that should be eventually relatively easy to use and performant on CPUs, GPUs and the like. I don't think we're quite there yet. I mean, as it is, I wouldn't call it very easy to use yet, but I hope we get there. Tapio, thank you very much again.